It was part of a conspiracy. All these things were planned. You don't know that. You're proud of living in a country where child killers are, get presidential pardons. We will never pardon anyone who is doing something wrong. The government of Sri Lanka has been strongly criticized at the UN Human Rights Council, which warned of a deteriorating situation in the country, the erosion of judicial independence, and the increased marginalization of minorities. My guest this week is Jayana Kolombagi, secretary to Sri Lanka's foreign ministry. Is there any chance at all that his government will take the criticism seriously and finally do something about them? Jayanath Kolombage, welcome to Conflict Zone. In the last few days, the UN Human Rights Council passed a landmark resolution highlighting your government's failure to ensure accountability for human rights violations and mandating UN investigators to collect and preserve data that can be used in future judicial proceedings. They did that, Mr. Secretary, because of your abject failure to do it for yourselves and because of the worsening human rights climate in your country. Aren't you ashamed of that? Well, Tim, let me say the World War ended 78 years later, uh, earlier, and we still see the residual effects on the environment, on the physical things, and the Good Friday Agreement was in 1998. And there are 116 walls, which, which is called peace walls, still Well, we're not talking about existence. Northern Ireland, Mr. Secretary. No, we're, talking saying... about, we're talking about Sri Lanka and your failure to ensure accountability for human rights violations, which you've already well, denied, you see, which you've no, denied we, in we other interviews. A, no, we had a war for one, one generation, and it takes time to heal a completely war. And it was a devastating war. It was a brutal war. Right? And we finished the war in 2009. And between 2009 and 2015, 92% of the land occupied by the military were released. 295,000 people who were used as a human shield were reintegrated and resettled into the community. 12,500... I, 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 understand, I understand all that, Mr. Secretary, but your, your foreign minister has already denied the accusations of serious human rights violations. You put up the inevitable barrage of denials and accusations of Western bias. Do you really think that the rest of the world is so stupid that they're going to immediately accept those denials in the face of overwhelming documented evidence of your current human rights abuses? I'm not talking about those just in the past. I'm talking about continuing human rights abuses in your country. Tim, Tim, where are these documents? Can we have a look at these documents that you are referring to? The UN has Proven sent them document. to you. The UN has sent them well, to you numerous times. You read them in the, in the resolution at the Human Rights Council. So it's a little strange for you to pretend that you haven't seen them. No, we have seen these documents prepared by the Human Rights Commissioner. That's okay, right? But, you know, there had been five, uh, I mean, from 2012, 2013, 2014, and now 2021. So every time this government comes to power, there is a resolution from the United Nations Human Rights Council, right? Is that fair? I think we have to ask back the Human Rights Council whether that is fair. It's Why fair do you that you should be held to account government? for your actions, isn't it, Mr. Secretary? No, your, no. Your, foreign minister, your foreign minister called the accusations false and complained that the whole resolution was politically motivated. Well, more than 40 well, countries co-sponsored this resolution. 22 voted for it, 14 abstained, only 11 against. You're rapidly losing international support and credibility, and the votes prove it. Tim, who are these 40 countries? 35 countries are in Europe, right? Then outside the Europe is Canada, America, England, Malawi, and Solom uh, Marshall Island. So 35 white countries got together and make this an unsubstantiated accusation allegation. So this is nothing to do with human rights in Sri Lanka. Oh, so they're, right? so they're, so they're, automatic, so they're automatically wrong. Even your good friend India, who you lobbied incessantly to vote against the resolution, they abstained. They weren't buying your denials either, were they? 
But look at what the, in, what the statement made by the Indian permanent representative in the beginning. They said this kind of country-specific resolutions are wrong. And then they said they abstain. That is their policy. That yes, we didn't, can't argue didn't on that. to support you. The real question from all this, Mr. Secretary, is do you want to be taken seriously on the international stage or just dismissed as one more serial human rights abuser protected by a small gang of other abusers? We want to be taken very seriously in the international community and no other country or entity is more interested than Sri Lanka to find a lasting solution to the residual issues that we have in Sri Lanka because we are a small country, small population and the harmony and peace is of critically important for us more than anyone else. But it has to evolve within us. No one can force reconciliation here. Let's... Um... You say you want uh, to heal wounds and you want reconciliation, but let's take the UN's charge of you marginalizing minorities. One of the worst examples has been your instruction to cremate the bodies of COVID victims, something that you knew would be deeply hurtful to your Muslim community and other minorities. You've now retracted this order, but you claimed in a recent interview that you simply followed the science and that the World Health Organization had originally instructed all COVID bodies should be cremated. That statement of yours was completely untrue, wasn't it? They never said anything of the kind. Well, if you look at the World Health Organization initial, they said cremation of all COVID bodies, it is there. Of course, no, they, they didn't. They no, they didn't, Mr. Secretary. Well, they check didn't. Again, what what, check what again. date? What date was that when they I said I don't that? have the details now, but I will come back to you on this. And then later on, they changed that to criteria the burial is permitted. And now that question is behind us, Tim. We have buried 69 I Muslim bodies. I know you want to change now. the subject, but you told them you made a statement that was blatantly false. Since March last year, the WHO made it clear that the burial of COVID victims was perfectly acceptable. Its statement called it a common myth that persons who've died of communicable disease should be cremated. But this is not true. Cremation is a matter of cultural choice and available resources. To date, there is no evidence of persons having become infected from exposure to the bodies of COVID-19 victims. That was March 20th last year, but you ignored all that, and your government kept on ordering the cremation of COVID victims, despite knowing that this would cause untold pain and distress. So your excuse that the World Health Organization said this falls apart. It just simply doesn't conform to the facts, Mr. Secretary. Well, it was never a political decision. It was always a health and science decision. Only thing, yes, we did fight against the decision to change that track, but it took some time. And we do understand that was not the best thing to do. We did hurt uh, the sentiments of a population or a community in Sri Lanka. That is not the best thing we could do. Yes, we do understand. I'm not arguing against that. But now we have corrected it and we have moved on. 69 bodies have already been buried. And now it's behind us. We took time. Talking of uh, marginalizing minorities, it turns out that your own president has indulged in some pretty inflammatory rhetoric over the last year, hasn't he? On November the 18th, he talked about legitimate fears that the Sinhala race, our religion, national resources and the heritage would be threatened with destruction in the face of various local and foreign forces and ideologues that support separatism, extremism and terrorism. This was a clear dog whistle to his supporters to be on their guard against Muslims and other minorities, wasn't it? This wasn't a call for national unity. He was blatantly pressing the fear button, knowing full well that it would stoke the kind of discrimination and disharmony that you claim to be fighting. Tim, you wait and see, there is a lot of evidence surfacing regarding the Easter bombing. Easter bombing was the single most devastating act, act of terrorism which took place in this country. Nearly 270 Christians, foreigners, and three hotels and three churches were bombed by the extremists. You wait and see the yes, evidence. Yes, that was 2019. That was 2019, and everybody, yes. everybody admits there's no argument there that this was a terrible attack. I'm talking about what your president said November the 18th last year, stoking the fires of intercommunal hatred. As I said, this wasn't a well, call for national that... unity. He was pressing the fear button, telling people to be afraid of the minorities. 
quite clear from what in, he said. In, I think in the same statement, if I remember right, he made it very clear that he is the president for all communities, all people in this country, although he was elected by the Sinhala majority. So you take one portion of that and argue, but I can argue back. It is not what the president meant. President has been very focal on maintaining harmony, but on the back of the election... It's it what was he said, Mr. Secretary, whether or not uh, he meant it, it, it it's, it's what he it, said. It, this is exactly what he said. He said, I am the president, and I am the president for all people of this country. So there was no racial uh, connotation in that. It was, contradicted remember, by Tim, what, it was contradicted by what he said about national resources and heritage. Sinhala heritage would be threatened with destruction. But, Mr. Well, Secretary, it, let's... It's been, it's, it's been threatened for the last five, six hundred years, from time to time. Yes, it has been. Yes, now, and we, that's we making people more and more fearful of minorities. Let's look no, at on your... The contrary. Let's, let's look at your anti-terrorism regulations, which have so upset mm -hmm. the UN and human rights groups. The International Commission of Jurists has consistently called for the repeal of this act, which has been used, it says, to arbitrarily detain suspects for months and often years without charge or trial. Why do you keep such repressive laws in place? Tim, from 2015 to 2019, there was a discussion of a counter-terrorism bill. The unity government, which was formed by coalition of the main two political parties with the support of EU, with the support of US and other countries, drafted the counter-terrorism proposal. That is the new act. But they could not just do it, right? So there are issues in our PTA. We do accept that. We need to revisit our PTA. We do accept that this long-term, uh, I mean, detention But you're taking is... your time on, on, on revisiting it. You've said that Sri Lanka has a very democratic regime, no repression whatsoever. These are your words. But your anti-terrorist laws make a nonsense of that. What place does arbitrary detention without charge or trial have in a democratic country? if that's what you are, if that's what you claim to be. Well, th this is why I said we need to revisit the Prevention of Terrorism Act and we need to draw lessons from the best practices internationally and we are going to do that, Tim. Believe but, it or but not, But meanwhile, we you're, passing, you're passing new repressive legislation. March the 12th this year, your so-called de-radicalization regulations. These allow for arbitrary administrative detention of people for up to two years without trial. This is a hallmark of repression, arbitrary detention without trial. You say you're working on it, but you keep passing new regulations that are just as repressive as the old ones. Well, imagine the situation if we did not have the PTA after the, 19, uh, the 2019 Easter bombing. We would not have been able to do anything in this country. It would have been utter chaos. Maybe somebody wanted the, uh, our country to be chaotic. So I am saying the PTA is in the, in the topic of discussion and we are determined to revisit and we are determined to amend. And also the long-term detainees, we need to find a solution to that. We do agree that it is wrong without charge to keep someone for a very long period. President already given directives to the Attorney General to find a solution to this. Mean, meanwhile, these regulations are in blatant violation of your international legal obligations, and they violate Article 13 of the Sri Lankan Constitution. Do you know what that article says? Well, I don't have a copy right now, but... Well, it's, it, what it says, if I, I can remind you, is that it guarantees freedom from arbitrary arrest, detention, and punishment. So you're so, breaking your own constitution with these new regulations, which you keep no, but passing. The term, arbitrary, term arbitrary doesn't come here. Tim, in the beginning, I requested you, please wait for another few weeks and you will come out. I mean, we, the investigators, will come out with the real picture. And then the whole world will agree what has gone Underneath, we have only seen the tip of the iceberg on the Easter bombing, but there is a whole heap of things which has happened before that, and it is happening even now. So things will come out in due course. And just PTA, we will revisit, but there will be new legislation uh, introduced to the country for the protection of human dignity, for the social harmony, fake well, news. Well, that would, that, would, that would make a change, wouldn't it? Because 
let's look at um, you know the way you've been handling um, trials and commissions. The main reason the Human Rights Council voted against you was that you've disrupted and impeded efforts to bring justice and accountability for all sides in the civil war. That's the UN saying that. They accuse you of, in, of entrenching impunity for grave human rights violations and abuses by all sides. This is now one of the hallmarks of your state, isn't it? Well, it has nothing to do, as you say, because if you remember, if you recall from 2009 to 2015, there were three commissions appointed to find out the way forward. But unfortunately, after 2015, none of these commissions could continue function. And now the president has appointed a commission of inquiry with a, retire, with a Supreme Court judge maintaining ethnicity balance, maintaining gen gender balance, in order to find answers to whether there are any issues regarding accountability, whether there are any issues regarding missing person. So give us time. We need, we have given them a time. We have in, given in, them well, six you, you, You've had time to disrupt and impede the existing um, judicial processes. Um, this obstruction, says the UN, has taken the form of actually arresting some of the war crimes investigators and threatening others. The UN said one former chief of the Criminal Investigation Division who led investigations into several key human rights cases was himself arrested, and another, Nishantha Silva, from the same division, had to leave Sri Lanka because of threats immediately after the last presidential election. And you tell me that's the way a democracy, which you claim to have, pursues justice? Doesn't look like it, does it? Well, everything is in the media. Everything is in front of the commission. A police inspector can leave to another country without taking approval within less than 12 hours. If he doesn't no have to be threatened. He, this, this particular no, he was person was threatened. He was threatened. He says he was threatened. He was not threatened. It was part of a conspiracy. All these things were planned. They were probably given lots of money to do these things. All these are you don't now coming know that. into... You don't know that, Mr. Secretary. That's, that's a smith. No, I'm saying that inquiries are coming out with all these things. That is why I said it takes time to come out with the truth. In January, in January last year, your presidential commission investigating so-called political victimization of public officials began intervening to halt prosecutions, including those of two former Navy officers charged in relation to the disappearance of 11 people in 2008 and 2009. This intervening in judicial proceedings doesn't inspire public confidence, does it? It's also this commission has intervened in favor of military intelligence officers, uh, interfered in other trials, including by withholding documentary evidence, threatening prosecutors with legal action, running parallel and contradictory examinations. All these are accusations by the United Nations. In other words, you've been destroying any chance of a proper trial and bringing proper accountability. You've allowed suspects to go free. You're not interested well, in the truth. Him, I will not comment on a presidential commission, and that matter is before the court in the country. There is a petition against that commission, so I am not in a position to comment on anything on that uh, presidential commission on political victimization, because it is a matter before the courts. Well, you may not want to comment on that. The fact is that uh, you have been freeing guilty people. In March last year, the president pardoned a soldier convicted of massacring eight civilians, including children. Human Rights Watch said it showed your government's disregard for justice for the worst abuses. Mr. Secretary, you pardon child killers. There are there no limits to which you won't sink? You a child killer, convicted child killer, gets a presidential pardon. What kind of country are you living in? Well, Tim, do you know that 12,500 ex-LTT combatants were pardoned similarly without any trial? Did you know that? Do you know 459 child soldiers as young as 10 were not even considered as combatants, but considered as victims of war and sent back to school to study with books and school bags and shoes? Right? So we have done both. Right? So I can't argue, I can't comment on a decision made by the president to pardon a person. And the previous regime also pardoned a LTTE hardcore terrorist. So these are things happening. So it is not only you, one you, side. You I'm, I come back to this. You're proud of living in a country where child killers are, get presidential pardons. 
You can't sing much lower than that. I, you're not, you're not I, holding your armed forces accountable. The message that that sends to your armed forces is basically you can get away with anything, can't you? If you can kill no, children, it's not like if you that. can kill children in cold blood, you can get away with anything. It is never like that. We will never pardon anyone who is doing something wrong. And the president is determined to make things right and make someone accountable if a person has done anything wrong against the law. A uh, president will never, ever take the side of a criminal. Never, ever. No, just give him a presidential pardon. Um, Mr. Secretary, your civil war... Is it may only in Sri Lanka these presidential pardons are there in the world now? We're not talking about the rest of the world. We're talking about Sri Lanka. No, no, but why? Why? Why only Sri Lanka? Why you only you talk about one person? Well, who, who do you represent? Six, you don't represent the rest of the world. I talk to the rest of the world about what they do. Oh, I mean, I'm talking to you about what Sri Lanka does. This is hypocrisy. I mean, you are talking about one person. It's not when hypocrisy. We have it's asking you to account for the actions people. of your government. It's as simple as that. No, it is just one person, and we have pardoned 12,500. Mr. Secretary, your civil war may have ended more than 12 years ago, but since your government isn't interested in accountability, thousands of family members from all communities are still seeking justice and truth about the fate of their loved ones. And your response to date has been to send state agents to harass and intimidate human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, social actors, and victims of human rights abuses. How, does, how helpful is that to your declared aim of bringing reconciliation and accountability to your country? How helpful is there that? Is a, there is an Office of Missing Person established according to the 30-1 in 2015, and this office is empowered, appointments made, budgetary allocations give, given, action plan is requested, and they have to produce results as I'm asking you about possible. the harassment. I'm asking you about the harassment. Your police no, have continually, your, your police have continually harassed a member of the adversary, advocacy group, Mothers of the Disappeared. One of them, whose son was disappeared in 2009, told Human Rights Watch that officers of the Criminal Investigation Department continually question her about who's going to meetings, who's going to give testimony in Geneva, what are they going to say? What business is that of your Criminal Investigation Division? Well, if there is an issue with a person, they can always complain to the police and they can seek redress from the judiciary. And our judiciary is very independent. And in these so-called areas, it's mostly it is their own natives who are the judges. So this, these are only accusations, very conveniently made, without any substance. Why don't they make a complaint to the police? They can make a complaint to the president. They can make a complaint to the inspector general of police. And they can make judiciary proceeding without doing that. You just complain, and then you mention about uh, human rights defenders. We, we know most of the human rights defenders are re receiving money from the West, and we know the bank accounts. We know how much money has come and gone, right? So these are not bona fide human rights defenders. They are playing to the tune of someone. Oh, none of them. You've, you've just smeared the whole lot of them in one sentence. Is that really what you want to do? You don't have no, the no, facts to smear, to, to smear he, he a whole to raft of your society defending human rights. Uh, we are very much interested in human rights. No one else is interested in human rights than Sri Lankans and Sri Lanka. That is a fact. No one is interested about human rights and reconciliation than Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka. Well, when your, is... your human rights record is criticized, you deny everything. Mr. Secretary, the UN insists that you address these criticisms, some of which we've talked about during this interview. And it also holds out the threat that member states might start applying targeted sanctions, asset freezes, and travel bans against your state officials and others credibly alleged to have been involved in human rights violations. Are you ready for that? Well, you know, if individual countries have a separate agenda, uh, not necessarily human rights, but using human rights as a weapon, there's very little we can do, but let's wait and see. I mean, we also have support uh, from large number of countries. It was evident in the Human Rights Commission proceedings. In the beginning, when the report was submitted, 21 countries uh, spoke against the Human Rights Commissioner's report. And in the proceeding discussions, there were a lot of opposition to this. Of course, the voting, they got 22, but even they got one vote less than the last time, 2014. And there were a large number of absentees, that is 14. So this world is divided. So 
know, you are, I mean, some very, countries very, accuse... Very, very quickly as we're running out of time, are you going to take note of these criticisms or are you going to stick to your blanket denials which no one believes? Whether we yes or deny no. or not, we are going to continue with the pledges that we have made to the international community to find answers for reconciliation, missing persons, we are going to, and accountability. We are going to find answers through a domestic mechanism as quickly as we can. All because right. we don't want to shed away from the responsibility to the international community more than that to the okay. people of this country. We've run out of time. Jayanath Kalambage, thank you very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you, Tim.